this period of time that we call the Jesus season. If you're our guest, let me explain that this is a period of time, as the video just said, between Christmas and Easter, when we as a church family are very intentional about focus, so focusing on the historical Jesus himself. One of the things we do is we read through a gospel together, one of the four in your Bible. This year it's Matthew. Uh, there are slips on your chairs with the reading schedule for that, but every week also you'll find it on the front side of your leaflet in the right-hand column. The first reading is just one chapter this week. It's where the story of the adult Jesus' ministry starts, which is Matthew chapter 4. Last week we uh, got ready, if you will, for the Jesus season as a church family uh, by starting where? The Gospels start when they tell us about Jesus' life and teaching. We started with somebody else named John the Baptist because John the Baptist's role in all four Gospels was to get people ready to encounter and hear from Jesus. Well, this week we want to continue with John the Baptist because this too, what we do today, is also going to be preparatory in a way for the three plus months that we spend together trying to hear from or get close to the person of Jesus. All four of your Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in your Bible, yes, start with the person of John the Baptist, but they also say that Jesus' public ministry and life started with a singular event. And it started in God, Matthew's Gospel with something you find at the end of Matthew chapter 3. It started with Jesus' baptism. This is how that event is described in the Gospel that we will read together this year. We read at the end of Matthew chapter 3, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John the Baptist at the Jordan River to be baptized by him. And Jesus was trying to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Why do you come to me to be baptized? But Jesus answered, Let it be this way now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. So then John the Baptist consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Then the first verse of chapter 4 that you will read this week, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. We are about to spend... Three months together as a church family reading through the Gospel of Matthew and me teaching through it on Sunday morning. That part of the Bible is just under 2,000 years old. Sometimes, you know, when people are interested in Christianity or Jesus or God in general and they ask us, what can we do to get to know Jesus better? What can we do to get to know about God better and begin to experience him in our life more? Our answer to them is well-meaning, but it can be fairly naive and simplistic. Sometimes we say to them, well, just read the Bible. Uh-huh. Ever tried to do that for yourself? A lot of people who, you know, you start in the Bible where typically you start in any other book, which is the beginning. And Genesis can be a fairly exciting, if not weird on occasion, book. And everybody stalls out somewhere around Leviticus, the third book in your Bible, because it is easily one of the hardest books in your Bible to wade through. It has all of these really weird laws and rules for the nation of Israel that seem to have nothing to do with you. Let's all admit together, even if we have been around the church block quite a bit, that reading the Bible such an ancient book can be difficult. It can be hard. It can be confusing. It can sometimes even be frustrating. So today, on the front end of the Jesus season, this period of time that we are devoting to get to know Jesus better and draw near to him, 
This is a message that isn't just about a subject. This is really as much about what you will experience when you read through the Bible, if you take us up on that offer. It is, if you will, a message about how to read the Bible and some of the things you will find when you do that. And it just so happens that this episode, the baptism of Jesus on the front end of Jesus' ministry, is a perfect passage for helping you get acclimated to what you will encounter in the Bible if you take the challenge of reading through Matthew in early 2015. So come back to this passage with me that all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, say start the ministry of Jesus. Um, the first thing I want to ask you is why did Jesus get baptized? Why? Oh, uh, the people who were getting baptized, if you remember from last week when we if you were here when we talked about John the Baptist, you'll remember the people who were getting baptized by John the Baptist were people who needed to repent. People who knew that they were far from God or not doing things in God's way and they needed to change. Well, is that why Jesus got baptized? Most people would say no. Okay, then why did he? Well, Jesus' own words are, let's do this now, John, because it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Oh, well, see, that's the answer. Great, what's that mean? Here's the deal. If you Google the question, why Jesus was baptized, you're going to get about half a dozen answers. And we don't know which one is right. Is it weird for me to say that and for you to hear it? This is an important passage. All four Gospels start the life of Jesus, the public adult ministry of Jesus with this event, and we don't know why he did it. Wow. Huh. How about this? Um... I'd like you to look at this part of that passage and tell me who saw the Spirit descending from heaven and who heard the voice of God say, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Now, if you have seen any popularized movie about the life of Jesus, um, like Jesus of Nazareth back in the 1970s, I'm dating myself a little bit, but if you saw that, which was a big cultural phenomenon, or anything more recent, you will often see the baptism of Jesus depicted where you see a physical dove fluttering down and landing like a pirate's parrot on Jesus' shoulder. And then you hear the James Earl Jones voice of God boom out for all the crowd to hear that this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. I'd like you to look at that passage and tell me if that's what it says. The answer is no. Who saw the Spirit descend on Jesus? Jesus did. John's Gospel will tell us that John the Baptist did too. So two people saw this happen. And two people at most heard the voice of God say that Jesus was his beloved son in whom he's well pleased. This was not a public event. It was a private happening. It was something very personal to Jesus himself. You see that? Um, was it a dove or was it like a dove? If you've been in church and had clip art, seen clip art in sermons on the Holy Spirit, it almost always has a dove on it. Well, was it a dove or was it like a dove? What's the passage say? It was like a dove. It wasn't a dove necessarily. That is, this is a description of something that fluttered down and came upon Jesus. It was something that came from heaven to Jesus. It may not have even been a physical thing. It could have been a spiritual thing. It was like a dove. It wasn't necessarily a dove. Wow. Can you see that sometimes when you read the Bible? And this will happen to you if you read through the Gospel of Matthew for the next three months. Sometimes when you read it, you realize... If I'm paying attention, this is a little confusing. This is a little hard to understand. In fact, there may be parts of it that you can't understand. Simply because we're 2,000 years removed from, from it and we don't have enough information. We weren't a part of that culture. We don't get it. But, 
even though all three of those things on the screen can sometimes be true of our experience of reading the Bible. That sometimes we don't understand part of what a passage is trying to say. That sometimes we are influenced by what, how everybody else understands it, and then you look at the passage and realize that's not what it's saying. Like who heard the voice and who saw the dove. Or sometimes it shouldn't be taken literally, it's just descriptive. It's trying to describe something that's not literal. It wasn't a dove, it was like a dove. None of those things on the screen, by the way, diminish the value of the Bible. We're just admitting what really we ought to say and what's true of our experience of trying to understand such an ancient, important book. It is still God's word to us. We still hear God's voice in it, but all three of those things are still true. And it's worth you knowing that as you prepare to read through the gospel this year or beyond that when you experience or read the Bible yourself in your own devotional life. These things being said, however, the conclusion you should draw is not to throw your hands up in the air and say, well, see, that's it. My pastor this morning told me that even though people tell me reading the Bible is such a good idea, well, I can't do it. I can't make heads or tails of it. That's not what I'm saying. In fact, I'm saying that if you accept some of these frustrations or limitations that I've lined out for you so far, your eyes may be opened to other things that you wouldn't see otherwise. Things you may have overlooked. The Bible always speaks. The Bible always has something to say, and sometimes its insights will be from places that, if you're not careful, you'll miss. So let's look again at this passage that has some parts to it that are hard or confusing. And let's notice that it still has some very profound things to say to us if we don't get fixated on the things that we don't understand. As you look at this depiction of the baptism of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, one of the things, if you're reading through the Gospel of Matthew, that will catch your attention in this passage is the Spirit of God shows up again. Now I say again because if you were here last week, you know that the Spirit of God has already been mentioned in the Gospels. In fact, it's already been mentioned by John the Baptist, who is a key figure in this baptism story. John the Baptist says that there is somebody coming after him who is not merely going to baptize people with water. He is going to baptize people in the Holy Spirit, with God's Spirit. And we talked about what that meant last week. That somebody was coming, he means Jesus, who was going to give people the opportunity to have an intimate, personal relationship with God that felt like spirit on spirit. Heart knit to heart. Mind knit to mind. It was going to be very close. God was no longer going to be removed and up there, but God was going to be as if He were inside of you or alongside you, walking arm in arm with you. This is what John said Jesus came to do. To baptize in the Holy Spirit. And lo and behold, when Jesus shows up, so does the Spirit. You see that? You have a topic mentioned before that now is repeated in the tale of the baptism. What do you see first about the Spirit of God and Jesus in the baptism? Well, you note that when Jesus was baptized by John... The Spirit descended from heaven like a dove upon Jesus. Jesus was not baptizing anybody with the Spirit yet. Jesus was being given the Spirit. In order to give the Spirit to others, He had to be given the Spirit first. Oh, that makes sense. Sure. In order for Him to give it to His followers, He had to be given it by God first. That's what you see here. And that makes you wonder, ah, I see. 
Jesus came to give us an experience of God's Spirit. To be drenched or baptized or dunked into God's Spirit. I wonder what that will be like. I wonder what that will feel like when I begin to live that way. Well, it's going to look a lot like Jesus. How do I know that? Because Jesus was given God's Spirit. Jesus says about Himself at the start of His ministry in the Gospel of Luke chapter 4 that the Spirit of the Lord was upon Him. One of the things you see in Jesus as you read through the Gospels is a life that is completely in step with God Himself. You see a man who is infused with God's Spirit. It's wisdom, it's power, and God's presence. And so when you think about what it looks like to experience God's Spirit, to be given God's Spirit by Jesus, start by looking at Jesus Himself. The whole point of God's Spirit in your life, being baptized in God's Spirit, is so that you become a little bit more like Jesus. The person who exemplifies what it looks like to be full of God's Spirit. In your Christian experience, what God is trying to do is through His Spirit, get you to be like Jesus. That means He is trying to get the attitudes of Jesus into you. That means He's trying to get you to act like Jesus. That means He's trying to get you to speak like Jesus. In your own unique way, according to your own personality, this is the goal. And you know that from the baptism of Jesus. Jesus will give you the Spirit. He was first given the Spirit. And He is a man who is imbued fully with God's Spirit. What you will encounter when you read through the Gospels is what it looks like for someone to be alive, fully alive, vibrantly so, in God's Spirit. That, however, is not the most surprising thing that you find in the story of the baptism of Jesus if you just pay attention to what the text actually says, and you pick up, in this case, on the Spirit of God being present in Jesus' baptism three times. Jesus was going to be baptizing people in the Spirit. The Spirit of God descended upon Jesus. But that is, those are only two. Did you pick up the third time that you see the Spirit of God show up? It's in the first verse of chapter 4 immediately after the baptism of Jesus, immediately after Jesus is given God's Spirit that He will later distribute to others, immediately Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert wilderness of Judea to be tempted by the devil. Hmm. The very first thing that God's Spirit does in Jesus' life is lead him out into the nothingness of the wilderness to be tested by the devil. And you'll get a chance to read about that episode this week in Matthew chapter 4. Does that surprise you? Um, if you and I were writing the baptism story, if you and I were writing the last part of Matthew 3 and the first part of Matthew 4, this is how it would have gone. Um, Jesus was going to give the Spirit to people. He was going to baptize people in the Spirit if they followed Him or believed in Him. And then at His baptism, it descended on Him, so He was given the Spirit first in order to give it to others later. And it was such a lovely experience. Angels were singing. Worship songs were being played with great gusto and joy. His heart was full of peace and love and kindness and patience. There was not a happier man in all the kingdom than Jesus. This is how the story of Jesus' baptism would end if you and I were writing it from the perspective of our conventional wisdom of what Christianity is in the year 2015. This, however, is not how the story goes. The story goes thusly. Jesus was given the Spirit of God at His baptism. And the very next thing that happened, Jesus' first experience of God's Spirit being with Him and in Him and full upon Him was that Spirit led Him. Other translations will tell you the word should be drove Him as with a whip. 
The Spirit of God drove Jesus into the wilderness to be tested. Wow. Now see, maybe you would admit with me at this point, this is another place where our own popular notions of what the God of the Bible does and does not do are challenged by what we find by reading the Scripture carefully. We in American Christianity don't even think about God being somebody who tests people. However, if you actually read the Bible, you find out that this is part of what God does to the faithful from time to time. If you were here at the beginning of the service, you heard Zechariah 13.9 read. This is one of half a dozen passages in the Old Testament where we are told in some that God will test us like gold and silver. He will put us in the refiner's fire, the phrase is from Zechariah 13, to see what we're made of. Maybe the most famous example in your Old Testament of this phrase being tested by God is from the life of Abraham. You find it in Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. Late in Abraham's life, this man who has been was found by God in his mid to late 70s, turned to God and gave his life to God, moved to a completely foreign land that uh, he had never seen before because God called him to do so. And after years of Abraham being faithful to God, God shows up and says to Abraham, I'd like you to sacrifice your only son, Isaac, to me. And we are told explicitly in verse 1 of Genesis 22, God did that to test him. Is there room in your conception of the Christian God for the idea that he tests us? Based on the baptism of Jesus, I think there needs to be. Here, of course, is the upshot. Um, if you're a Christian person, then you have been given God's Spirit. We are told by John the Baptist that this is what Jesus came to do. He came to give people God's Spirit. Based on the experience of Jesus himself, guess what? If you've been given God's Spirit, sometimes, here's what that Spirit's going to do to you. He's going to test you. He's going to try to reveal your character. He's going to find out what you're really about. All of us here who are Christians this morning would raise our hand and say, absolutely, we believe in God Almighty. We believe in a God of love and grace. We believe in a God who never tires of forgiving us. These things we say are true. We believe in the ethics of Scripture. We believe in the love your neighbor idea. We believe that patience is better than impatience. We believe that self-control is better than no control of your body and mind at all. All of us would say this to one another. But on occasion, God wants to find out if you really mean it. And then, like Abraham of old, He will test you. Jesus is going to be driven into the wilderness for 40 days. He will have no food and no water, we are told, for 40 days. And then the devil shows up to test him, to find out what he's really made of. You realize, even if it seems like a hypothetical question, if Jesus had failed the test in the wilderness, you would have had nothing else happen in the life of Jesus. The Jesus you know and love, the ministry and the words and the teaching that enthrall us would have never happened if Jesus was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness and had failed. It never would have happened. Sometimes the Spirit of God wants to get to the bottom of us. See, it's easy in the good seasons of our life to say, I believe in God and I trust Him. I have given Him my entire life. And I'm willing to go where He says. I'm willing to do what He says. I'm willing to take the risks that He wants me to take. I'm willing to do the hard things that other people don't understand, yes. I sign on that dotted line, I will do that. Well, when things in your life are good, when you have everything you want, it's easy to do that. What about when things aren't good? 
What about when some of those things in your life you really want, you no longer have? What about when you can't pay the bills? What about when you lose your job unexpectedly and you're afraid for your family's future? What about then? Sometimes God's Spirit leads us into those moments, into those scenarios, because He wants to find out what you're really about. Everyone can say that they believe in God. Everyone can say that they entrust themselves to God. What happens when the rubber meets the road? If you read this hard passage in the Gospels, one that we don't fully understand, you still can find things that are extraordinarily powerful, extraordinarily powerful to realize, like if God's Spirit is in our life the way that He was in Jesus' life, sometimes what He does is test us. Some of you this morning may be going through a test just like that. Some of you may have circumstances in your life that are unraveling that make you deeply anxious or afraid. You cannot see around the corner. Or all of a sudden it seems, seems like everything that was right is turning wrong. I can't guarantee you why that's happening to you. And I certainly would couch and coach you that God is not directly doing that to you. But maybe part of what God wants to see is how you're going to respond. It's okay to complain to him. We know that from the Bible. Being faithful to God does not mean you don't complain to him. Sometimes part of being faithful to God, if the Psalms of the Old Testament are any indication, means that you do have enough faith to complain to him. Sure. But will you abandon him? Will you speak badly of him to others? Will you get impatient if things don't happen or resolve themselves as quickly as you want? What's going to happen? I wonder what it was like for Jesus in the episode you will read this week. As he was starving in the Judean wilderness, waiting for God to end his test. I wonder, can you relate? God wants to know what you're all about. And sometimes in your life, he's going to put things in there. He's going to lead you into situations that will help him figure that out. How will you respond? What will you do? Will you respond with the faithfulness of Jesus, who emerged from the crucible of the Judean wilderness to be the man that you know and love? The man who ultimately turned the world on its ear and changed everything because the Spirit drove him to be tested. What about you? Here are four uh, quotes that I snipped out of different uh, articles and passages about the baptism of Jesus and specifically this role that God's Spirit can sometimes play in our life. See if these four little quotations don't aptly summarize what you find here about the Spirit of God in our lives. First, if God needed to test the character of His Son, we should not be surprised that on occasion He needs to test ours. Yeah, I buy that. What about you? If He had to do it to Jesus, I get it why He needs to do it to me on occasion. Because I'm not Jesus. What about you? How about this? God does not test us to see if we're worthy. He's testing us to see if we're ready. That's exactly what he was doing to Jesus. Would Jesus be who God destined Jesus to be? Was he ready for what was to follow? Only the testing in the wilderness as initiated by God's Spirit would reveal that. Maybe that's part of what's going on in your life. This is not about your worthiness. This is about your readiness for where he wants to take you next. And the only way he'll know is by testing your faith now. To see how committed you really are, how much you really trust him,
today before tomorrow ever comes. How about this? At times, God tests us not to reveal our weaknesses, but so that we'll discover our strengths. Oh yeah. That's absolutely what was going on in the life of Jesus during His baptism and then His temptation in the wilderness. You want to know why Jesus could withstand sweating blood in the Garden of Gethsemane and staring down His execution on a Roman cross some three years after these events that we talked about today? You know why? It's because He'd been tested for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness and His character was true. That's why. It was no surprise to God Almighty that His Son could make it through His own murder because He had already found out how strong His Son could be on the front end of His ministry and His life. Maybe that's part of what the Spirit wants to reveal to you in those hardships that you face. He wants you to realize you are far stronger because of God in your life than you realize. And He wants you to see that. Last. God is going to keep bringing you the same test over and over and over again until you pass it. Don't like the idea of God testing you and trying to help you figure out the limits of your faith? Guess what? You're going to get to do it over and over and over again. He is not satisfied for you to be lazy. He is not satisfied for you to be shallow. He is not satisfied for you to be a person who says you believe in God and word only. He is not going to leave you there. And so over and over again, he is going to bring you into situations or circumstances where your faith will have a chance to be tested and honed and refined and grown. And he will not let you off the hook. Because he cares about you too much and who you will become and how you can affect the world and those around you if you are just willing to grow through these tests. You're going to have a chance at the end of the service to pray about this uh, really surprising, insightful gleaning from the episode of Jesus' baptism. And specifically, this particular role that God's Spirit sometimes plays in our life just like in Jesus' life. Let me pray for us, and then we'll sing again. Go ahead and be seated. We're going to end today by praying a little bit together about what you heard today. Um, and specifically, Matthew 4.1, which is how we ended, and where we ended the message, what we talked about at the end of the message. And again, because I want you to uh, have a great experience uh, reading through the Gospel of Matthew this year, and I told you that today is really as much about you getting the chance to watch me work through a passage and glean from it so you can do the same, I want you to catch something here. This too is about repetition. This is where you hear something earlier in the Gospel of Matthew, and then lo and behold, it comes up again, and you are meant to make the connection. So you heard today that uh, at the front end of Jesus' life and ministry, God's Spirit drove him into the wilderness to be tempted or tested by the devil so God could get to the bottom of or plumb the depths of his character and his faith to see if he was ready to be all that you and I know of Jesus. Um, two chapters later, in the Gospel of Matthew, a passage you will read not this week, but next. You run into this prayer. What you and I know is the Lord's Prayer. You know these words, right? Okay, I want you to land on that phrase right there. And now I want you to think about what it means. Based on what you heard today. Lead me not into temptation, deliver me from evil. Think Jesus had some first hand experience with that? 
Yep. You want to know why he told you to pray it? Because he'd been through it. He knows what it's like to be led into a season of tremendous testing and temptation. He knows what it's like to ask God, wow, deliver me from this. He knows what it's like from Matthew 4 to do first-hand, first-person battle with evil or Satan himself. And he says, that's why I'm telling you, you need to appeal to God to deliver you from great evil. My point to you is simply this. When you read that prayer that we all know and love, you need to remember that Jesus told us to pray that because he knows what it's like. And when you read those phrases in the Lord's Prayer, you're supposed to remember the story from which they come. That Jesus himself was led into temptation and prayed to God Almighty that he would be delivered from that evil. And sure enough, he was after 40 days and 40 nights. So I'd like you to take a moment here at the end of the service and I'd like you to personalize that phrase from the Lord's Prayer. I'd like you to think about the temptations or tests that you face in your life today. And I'd like you to pray about weathering them well. I'd like you to pray about God developing your character and faith the way that those things did in Jesus' life. I'd like you to pray about being delivered from the evil that you face. Just like Jesus faced evil out in the Judean wilderness at the end of those 40 days and 40 nights. Would you do that? Take a moment, just be quiet, and pray about what Jesus meant when he told us to pray, lead me not into temptation, and deliver me from evil. Take a minute and do that, would you?